Are you on Instagram? If so, then please give Adventure Diaries a follow. The page is at Adventure Diaries underscore underscore or simply search Adventure Diaries Chris Watson and you'll find additional podcast content and adventure content too. So go and add me now on Instagram and I'll see you over there. Thank you. Yeah, I've definitely ended up in some very dicey situations. Um, I was held at gunpoint in a Malaysian gambling den on a layover, uh, which which was a harrowing experience. Um, and actually, uh, in Tajikistan, I was detained by military police at the airport uh, when we left. Uh, and that got pretty dicey uh, as well. I was born and raised in in the US in the 90s and I sort of was just raised believing num- America was number one and America was, was the best and and uh, you know that's just the attitude that I went out into the world with when I started traveling when I was a teenager and it's pretty amazing to slowly have that peeled away <laughs> and see all of these other cultures and um ways of living uh, that highlight some things that uh, I thought I was sold America did the best and uh, have come to realize that maybe some other places do them pretty well, if not better themselves. One of our most sort of epic adventures was was trekking to Everest Base Camp in Nepal, which was the last sort of uh, the big ending <laughs> of our six months um, of travel. And that, that kind of cleansed the immediate need to get off these these experiences that we had just always dreamed of. Welcome to the Adventure Diaries podcast, where we share tales of adventure, connection, and exploration. From the smallest of creators to the larger than life adventurers, we hope their stories inspire you to go create your own extraordinary adventures. And now your host, Chris Watson. Welcome to another episode of the Adventure Diaries. Today, we're chatting to Jeff Jones, one half of the adventure travel duo, What Doesn't Suck. What Doesn't Suck are a half French, half American married couple that have been creating adventure travel videos, including a very popular series, 48 Hours in a Given Location, which has amassed an incredible 15 million views. They have covered some 93 plus countries across the planet, including some of the most remote places on the planet, So whether they're creating content in the likes of the Sudan, Nepal, Thailand, covering a European road trip, what doesn't suck is a real testament to the transformative power of travel. And in today's conversation, Jeff gives insights on authentic storytelling, the significance of volunteering. So whether you're a seasoned traveler or a curious explorer, Jeff's experiences and reflections promise to inspire, challenge and encourage you to discover the beauty and the depth of the roads less traveled so settle in and enjoy this fantastic conversation with jeff johns of what doesn't suck jeff johns welcome to the adventure diaries how are you i'm doing great thanks uh thanks very much excited to be here yeah so thank you for giving up your time we're here today to talk about i think you've done a little bit of travel just a bit just a bit (laughs) (laughs) yeah about half the countries in the world, by the looks of it, I think ninety-three countries or so. Yeah, right? yeah, about that, about uh, about that. It's been a wild ride. Yeah. So, so how long? So, when did what doesn't suck start? Is that about a decade or so? Yeah, it's uh, it started early two thousand fifteen. Um, Anne and I met uh, in Dubai um, randomly just after I had moved there at a, at a job that I I took there. She had just uh, finished her master's and, and randomly started a job at the same small company I was working at. We met, hit it off, had a sort of secret uh, romance in the office, and um, in our spare time, started traveling together. Uh, we, we actually pinky promised each other on our first date, which was a, a business meeting, which turned into a date. Uh, when we'd only known each other a few weeks, uh, I pinky promised that I'd take her to Thailand and you know that famous Bill Murray quote where he says, if you think you love somebody, get on a plane, go see the world. And when you land back at JFK, if you still love them, propose. So I said, let's put, uh, I don't think there's anything that puts a relationship to the test like travel. So um, that's that's really where our sort of love affair 
personally and for travel started. And when we got back, we were so excited to continue traveling. We thought, let's channel this into something. And what doesn't suck was an idea that came around uh, somewhat naturally uh, after seeing all of the negative comments that fill the internet about everything. We kind of just said, well, what, oh, yeah. do, what doesn't suck out there? Let's try to feature that. Hmm. What, what was, uh, how long were you in Dubai for then? Because you're from the States, aren't you? Yeah, originally uh, born and raised in Washington, D.C. Spent a decade in Los Angeles, um, getting my degree in visual journalism, photography, working in documentary, uh, film production, uh, television production. Uh, I lived two years in, in uh, Southeast Asia and Thailand after that, and then moved to Dubai um, for a web TV uh, startup where I worked. Uh, so so my my whole, whole background is in television production and, and sort of travel photography to begin with. Um, and I ended up in Dubai for four years, and, and Anne was there for two years before me, so she was there for six. Yeah, sure. Was that a big decision to to give up the kind of the, the start the job in Dubai to, to go for to to go for the 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 travel lifestyle and travel blogging? Yeah, you know, it's uh, Dubai is an absolutely fascinating city. Um, and it's really a really interesting place to to live and work, and it was a very exciting chapter in our lives. It's also a very transient city. Um, lots of people mm. that are sort of young and unattached live there for a short period of time, tax-free salaries um, and whatnot. And uh, many people are, are there and then oftentimes go back home. For Anne and myself, we found it an amazing place to travel from. I think something like two-thirds of the world's population lives within an eight-hour flight of Dubai. So we realized we could be in Beirut one weekend and at the pyramids the next and at the Taj Mahal the weekend after that. And it was all two to three hour flight away. Um, and with the budget airlines in the region, the travel opportunities to some really exciting and exotic locations that had always been on the other side of the world for me were kind of right at our doorstep. Uh, that, that was going to be one of the questions, actually, how these places were so accessible. So, so essentially, Dubai was your hub then because you've been to some you know, phenomenal places, uh, yeah, and and some some interesting places as well. I think Tajikistan was one that stood stood out uh, more so because I'd actually I've had a guest on where we're talking about a trail, a hiking trail in Tajikistan, and I hadn't really done much research. Yes, and the fan mountains. On it and it, yeah, yeah, yeah. What was that like? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, it 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 was really amazing and. Anne and I really became um, interested in finding places that were sort of off the beaten path, a little bit less accessible or a little bit less known. Um, that's how we ended up in Sudan. <laughs> that's how we ended up in Tajikistan. Um, that's how we ended up in, in many different places. Um, and we would just wait for the the sort of airlines to release their 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 new sort of lineup of fares and we would just look at you know all these places many in cities that, countries that we hadn't really heard of or heard nothing about and didn't know anything about and that was kind of our approach with what doesn't suck was well let's put a french girl and a dumb american guy on an airplane and drop them in the middle of a new city in a country they know nothing about and if they can figure it out then maybe we can inspire people to get on a plane and go check out some other places themselves yeah, and I'd recommend people go and have a look through your YouTube channel. Some fantastic content on there. So, so did did you have a theme then, or was it just did you just roll the dice or spin the wheel, spin a, a bottle on the map or something, or was it whatever was cheap airfare? How did it? How did you plan your journeys? Yeah, it really uh, it was a combination of uh, cheap airfare and flight times at the beginning. You know, we were. Uh, in much of the Muslim world, the, the working week was um, uh, Sunday through Thursday. Dubai's changed that since we left, and, and now the weekend's uh, Saturday, Sunday. But at the time, Friday and Saturday were the two days off. So we would look at, okay, if we if we leave work on Thursday at 5 o'clock, can we get on a plane that evening and fly overnight and land mm -hmm. somewhere Friday morning? And then can we land back a couple hours before we have to be at work on Sunday morning? And uh, that's really how we planned many of our adventures. <laughs> Yeah, because you've got a whole section, haven't you, related to like 48 hours, like the kind of 48 hour kind of layover? Or... I think, uh, yeah, so that's really how our 48 hour guides came to be. We we landed one weekend mm -hmm. in Beirut and thought we, we'd started filming a little bit um, 
you know, we were working at this web TV startup. I had this background in sort of documentary film production. We had these mm-hmm. iPhone sevens in our pockets and we thought, let's just film the 48 hours in Beirut. And I think over the course of the next few years, we filmed 25 different 24 hour episodes, uh, all over the world and all with two beat up iPhone sevens, <laughs> no mics, no lights, <laughs> nothing fancy. That was that. Oh, did, did you have a kind of storytelling approach to that, you know, considering your background or did you just kind of capture the content and then see how it went? Yeah. Uh, having a background in tele- television production, filming and editing really helped with the, with the, being able to understand this is what we have to capture in order to properly mm-hmm. tell a story. There needs to be a beginning, middle and end. We need to hint at things at the beginning. We need to give, you know, a lot mm-hmm. of information that makes it interesting to people. Uh, and we also have to keep people engaged, right? We were shooting content mm-hmm. for social media, for Facebook and YouTube. We needed to be quick. We needed to be fast um, to try to get, you know, uh, our message across. So so that was really uh, the goal. And over time, we got much, much better. Our, our first video in 2016 <laughs> in Beirut, uh, it's a bit rough around the edges, but by the time we got into Greenland and Albania and some of these other places, uh, a few years later, we'd uh, added in a drone and some GoPros and, and really figured wow. out how to, to tell a more compelling story. Yeah. Is there any shows or like uh, travel writers or anyone you were trying to stylize against or that influenced your work? That's all. Yeah, I would say the, the easy cliche answer is, is Anthony Bourdain, no reservations. That's, that's sort of the, say the, the Leova. standard. Yeah, I was going to say that. Yeah, I think yeah, the 48 hour reminds me the Leo over. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Yep, yeah, yeah that as well. But I, I think Anthony Anthony Bourdain for me was uh, a huge inspiration um, as somebody who really just embraced a new culture, embraced strangers, embraced, embraced showing up and just seeing what a place is all about mm-hmm. and really diving into it and getting off the beaten path. And uh, that's the kind of travel that we really like. Yeah, likewise. Yeah, he's a, he's a phenomenal human being. It's, it's sad that he's no longer with us. I think some of that is some of his own quotes Treasure. about, you, yeah, you, you don't need to to agree with the person beside you, but you can respect them, sit down and have a conversation and have an agroni or two and still just, you know, get immersed in the culture. And yeah, that's a, that's a shame. Absolutely. Uh, okay, move it, moving on from that, is, it, was there, is there any locations or cultures or, or anything that, that resonates with you? I mean, you're obviously close in the Middle East, you've been to Beirut, some of like Tajikistan and stuff. What, what what the cultural experience is like on your travels. We'll be back after a quick break. Are you on Instagram? If so, then please give Adventure Diaries a follow. The page is at Adventure Diaries underscore underscore or simply search Adventure Diaries Chris Watson and you'll find additional podcast content and adventure content too. So go and add me now on Instagram and I'll see you over there. Thank you. Yeah, you know, it's really, it's really interesting coming from an American perspective. Um, you know, I was born and raised in in the U.S. in the '90s, and I mm-hmm. sort of was just raised believing num- America was number one and America was the best. And and uh, you know, that's just the attitude that I went out into the world with when I started traveling when I was a teenager. And it's pretty amazing to slowly have that peeled away <laughs> and <laughs> see all of these other cultures and um, ways of living uh, that highlight some things that uh, I thought I was sold America did the best and uh, have come to realize that maybe some other places do them pretty well, if not better themselves. So um, spending time in, in Southeast Asia and Thailand, uh, especially after the tsunami, when I first I first moved there in 2004, that was absolutely eye opening. It was my first real tro- solo travel, and it really just broke up with my whole perception of of the world. Um, and and after that chapter, having this opportunity to move to the to the Middle East, a culture which I really knew absolutely nothing about, was another opportunity to say, "All right, let's keep pushing these boundaries and and learn more." There's so much out there um, that I can learn from. And, and every one of these places, like every traveler knows, you pick up these little pebbles um, of perspective uh, again and again and again. It absolutely broadens your, your 
perspective of the world, you know? Yeah, I agree. Is there any is there anywhere you've revisited? Wait, is there anywhere it's left such a lasting impression that you've been back to or that you'd like to go back to? Uh I would have to say it's it's Thailand. Um it's somewhere that had such a huge effect on me and a huge part of my heart is in Thailand, uh is in Phuket. Um that's where I spent that time. I've gone back. I ended up living there again uh ten years later in 2013, 14. Uh, and a place that Anne and I have gone back multiple times as well. Uh, and so that that will always just have a, a big part of my heart. Okay. Yeah, it's likewise. It's a, it's a great. I, I, haven't, I actually haven't been for over 10 years now, but yeah, I've been, been many times up until that, until I had kid, well, a little girl. But it's the, the far flung destinations are yeah. few and far between at the moment. Changes things, <laughs> huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So in terms of, uh, you know, being on your travels, is there anywhere that's, you know, we're talking of places culturally that have left, a, you know, a, an imprint on you, but is it, is it, have you came across anything that's taken you out of your comfort zone that you thought, shit, shouldn't be here, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have done that, or, yeah, it's more um, crazy. Yeah, I've definitely ended up in some very dicey situations. Um, I was held at gunpoint in a Malaysian gambling den on a layover, uh, which which was a harrowing experience. Um, and actually, uh, in Tajikistan, I was detained by military police at the airport uh, when we left. Uh, and that got pretty dicey um, as well. Um but you know there there hasn't been any any culture in and of itself that's made me feel uncomfortable. There's just good and bad people everywhere, and people that are going to mm. take advantage of you if they can. And you know, uh, I often say I felt more uncomfortable more times living in Los Angeles than I did ever traveling around the world. That being said, I'm a a pretty big, sometimes intimidating uh get looking guy so you know mm. i don't i don't claim to know what it's like to, to travel as anyone other than 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 myself but um i haven't found a culture that hasn't been unwelcoming uh on the whole mm. Mm. What, what how were you filming it in when you when you were detained or or because uh, i've had a couple no. of guests that have mentioned some strange situations because of the camera that's got them into trouble no. Yeah, you know, from all of my filming experience, I've gotten into some dicey situations filming with large film crews um, mm -hmm. around the world. Um, when I was in in the Middle East, I was working on on TV shows for um, National Geographic, Abu Dhabi, Discovery Channel, Arabia, bigger networks where I was traveling with larger crews uh -huh. um, to Morocco, to uh, Saudi Arabia, places like this where where we really kind of needed to watch what we were doing and. Um, I had some early lessons in what to do and what not to do. So for Anne and I, w one of the reasons that we embraced only filming with our cell phones uh, is that it really doesn't look obvious. You can film things mm -hmm. very easily and you look very mm -hmm. innocent. Um, there's no tripods. There's no big equipment. There's no lights, no microphones. <laughs> um, so aside from maybe being told off if we were lifting the camera somewhere, we just looked like innocent you know, tourists who didn't know any better. So you, your your life in TV then it sounds like you've been to some kind of fantastic places working some big networks. That, do you miss that at all, or is, is, are you fulfilling that itch through some of your work that you're doing now? Yeah, you know I work for a large um, e-commerce travel company now, based here um, in the Netherlands. Um, so I still get to work um, in the in the broader travel field, and um, we've now got two little ones running around and so the ability to jump you know on an airplane to the other side of the world for a weekend uh needs to be planned a little bit um in more detail so Maybe. i don't miss uh the big productions um i had a lot of fun but i did that for for nearly 20 years and um oh. i love adventure there will be another chapter for it uh but yeah. right now is not that time yeah. Well, swapping Dubai for, you know, you've got Schiphol Airport, no doubt, nearby, which also gives you great accessibility. It's crazy, isn't it? In, in the US, you can yeah. probably be 
five hours, six hours on a flight and you're still in the same country, albeit very different states, but you do that in Europe and you you get different languages, different cultures, and you've got a very different experience. It's fantastic. You know, my, my daughter and I um, are uh, flying to Copenhagen this weekend, uh, oh, just the two of us for a short weekend. And, um, you know, she's, she's too young. She's, she's only three and a half. She won't remember much oh. of it, but it will be a fantastic time for us. And it's something that's so easy. It's an hour flight or something. And we can go do that, you know, pretty easily. Um, my wife's family lives in France. We're easily able to see them. And, you know, my family lives uh, on the East Coast in, in the U.S., which is a quick flight away. And my parents actually live in Ecuador, in South America. And there's a direct flight to Schiphol from, uh, from Ecuador, wow. which is interesting. <laughs> so that was definitely one of the reasons that when we were looking at where do we settle after Dubai, this was a, yeah. a really... Uh, Amsterdam in the Netherlands ticked a lot of boxes. Yeah. Do you think you're settled there then for the foreseeable um, in, in the Netherlands? Uh, you know, we never say never. We have no idea. And it's very bizarre to imagine a, a forever home, and especially in a country yeah. that's um, neither mine or my wife's, you know. But um, with, with little kids, you got to do what's right for them. And, and right now, uh, we've got a little one as well who's just a few months old. So uh, we're getting through those first couple of years and, uh, you know, we'll see what happens. Yeah. yeah. Congratulations. Excellent. Yeah. Cheers. So, Cheers. So going back to, so back to some of your adventures then uh, under the, the What Doesn't Suck uh, brand, you know, I think you said some fantastic content on YouTube and Twitter or X, whatever we're calling it these days. Uh, so, so talk us through something because well sorry let me rephrase that your your bucket list uh adventures you've ticked a fair few yep. of those off haven't you so, so t- talk us through mm-hmm. some of the best experiences in there yeah i think you know ann and i were really aware during our time in dubai that um you know when it when it became that we clear that we were going to get married and when it became clear that we were going to leave Dubai and move on somewhere else. It was pretty obvious that we were going to try to start a family and that was going to be a shift, you know, um, in our journey. So we really looked, you know, hard at what are the experiences we, we really want to have now and, and that we don't want to regret later. So like I said, being close to so many things, um, you know, we, we, we flew to India, did the golden triangle, Saw the Taj Mahal and, and Agra and Jaipur and Delhi. Um, the next weekend, we flew to the to the Great Pyramids and I and I proposed out in the desert, um, which was you know one of our our most exciting um, adventures. And then we just continued saying you know where are the places that we really want to see in the world um, before we settle down. And when we left Dubai, we saved aggressively for a year, and then we traveled for six months um filming adventures all over uh we did a a month-long road trip in the u.s and we went to the salt flats in bolivia and machu picchu Mm -hmm. we went to um greenland uh because we really wanted to to see the nature there um spent a month in indonesia and and then one one of our most sort of epic adventures was was trekking to everest base camp in nepal which was the last sort of uh, the big ending <laughs> of our six months uh, of travel. And that, that kind of cleansed the immediate need to get off these, these experiences that we had just always dreamed of. Yeah, and that's quite a lot to cram in in such a, such a short space of time. Did you feel, feel burnt out with it at all, or, or was it just the um, fulfillment? You know, it... Um, it was exciting and we really, it, 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 it sounds like a lot and it, it was, but six months is also a, a lot of time. So we were able to spend mm. a month in South America, a month in the U S we spent six weeks in Indonesia. Um, and in this, as opposed to, I mean, you have to remember, we did a lot of our travels in 48 hours, right? So spending six weeks yeah. somewhere was like, you know, oh my God, what are we going to do with all this time? We could rent an apartment and rent a motorbike and, you know, really sort of take our time. Um, and all of the time that we traveled and we knew that we were going to leave Dubai and a lot of these 48 hour trips were little investigations. Where do we want to live? Are these, you know, we went to some pretty exotic sounding places, but we also just really wanted to see 
what is out there in the world? Are there other countries that we may want to go spend a chapter in? Um, we may fall in love with somewhere. And uh, I think like many travelers, when you're traveling, you, first thing you do when you walk down the street is go, I wonder how much an apartment costs yeah. here. And you kind of start playing out, <laughs> could I live here for how long, right? So we really wanted to to do that. And, and during those travels, we spent some time in Amsterdam and um, we thought, wow, this really ticks a lot of those boxes. Uh, maybe this is a place we could settle yeah. down. Yeah, it's interesting. I think there was some because I, I travel through uh, Schiphol and Amsterdam quite a bit myself, and I don't think it's the the, the most cost effective, but it's not the most. It's not cheap compared to some some other locations in in Central Europe. But I suppose you do have the accessibility of the, the airport and the, and the rail network. So, and it's a lovely place, isn't it? The Netherlands, yeah. Really. Yeah, you know, um, our, it, it was it was going to be quite a shock wherever we moved from Dubai um, mm. because Dubai is so unique and so different, uh, mm. and of course, pay zero tax. So we had to come yeah. to come to the you know come to accept the fact that we we're going to go from from paying zero percent to what we pay here in the Netherlands, which is you know close to fifty percent. Uh, yeah. But we were also burned out in Dubai, we were exhausted, we were stressed. Um, and, and I particularly with the work I was doing, it was, um, really unsustainable. So finding that work-life balance and that quality of life that we are able to mm. find here in the Netherlands, especially for, for, uh, having a family that was worth any amount of tax to be able to live in yeah. a, a high quality life. Um, and, and that, that really is what, you know, convinced us this, this was, this was the spot. Yeah, it's cert certainly a much slower pace of life there, isn't it? E even compared to where I am in the UK and Scotland, you know, some of like the Netherlands and you know many European countries, they are. I, I don't know if it's just the British way or not, but they are much slower paced and they have a much better work-life balance than, than what we do over here. Yeah, so, you know, we were we were excited to work from home um, and take our bikes everywhere. And uh, just have more access to nature and to seasons. And uh, again, coming from the Middle East, those were all things that sounded pretty intriguing and desirable. Yeah. So, how does your wife like it? If, she, if she's she's French, does she get more chance to go home to France then? Yeah, yeah you know, it's interesting. She's from the uh, the south of France, which is extremely idyllic, and and something that we always people always ask us is. So your wife's from the south of France and you're from the U.S. Why on earth don't you live in either of those places? <laughs> um, but she's in a situation where she doesn't feel an urge to go back to, to France. And the U.S. is dealing with a lot right now that doesn't make it the most desirable place to, to move back to. Um, and Amsterdam also is majority English speaking and there's a mm -hmm. lot of English speaking large companies that are based here that give a yeah. uh, a wide range of uh, career opportunities and a huge expat population um and and if we were living in France um we'd get a lot more sunny days but we, we language barrier would be very challenging for me and and uh, we'd really struggle to I think build that that international community as well so this is a mm -hmm. You know, it's a third culture for us, which is interesting. Um, our, our daughter speaks to us in Dutch and French and English, and we try to keep uh -huh. keep up, and it's, it's very exciting. Oh, that's, <laughs> uh, that's amazing. But it, it works for us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that's, that's excellent. Your, your little one uh, being multilingual, that's incredible. Excellent. That's yeah, so, pretty funny to so, watch. So she had preschool then or at that age or...? Oh, yep. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. So we're always trying to to digest what is she saying, what language is it in. <laughs> she said what, what the grammar is all sort of mixed up, and um, right now it's just providing us with quite a bit of entertainment. But uh, at some point, she'll sort it all out and switch, and and it will be pretty exciting. So, so coming back to your your brand, then, so what doesn't suck. Uh, so, t ten or so years in the making. Are, are you? What's the plans for that? Then you can chance to to work on that whilst you're in the the kind of day job at the moment. You get the balance to, to to create. Yeah. So the um, yeah. So what doesn't suck had a 
um, a really popular time period. Well, of course, we were living in Dubai and filming these videos and uploading mm -hmm. them. And our, the ends of our travels and settling here in the Netherlands coincided with COVID and lockdowns and mm -hmm. uh, the arrival of our daughter. This all happened kind of at the same time. Um, so that went on the back burner for, um, for a bit, but also has just provided us, um, time to take a pause, which we, uh, felt was long overdue. Um, there is an immense tsunami of travel content being created every minute on every platform everywhere. And something that's important for us is to feel like we're inspiring people to, travel and that we're creating unique content, but that we're also creating content that is not repetitive and is mm -hmm. not just churning out content for the sake of churning out content and taking time to pause and sort of assess what's the most value that we can provide to, uh, to people and, and how can we, you know, be sensitive of the people that follow us and not just fill their timelines with repetitive sort of recycled mm -hmm content that they see on every single other platform they follow and everybody else. So that's where we've really tried to take a step back and say, all right, how can we continue to try to do what we do? Um, and the 48 hours concept was fantastic. Um, but like I said, we did about 25 of those episodes. Um, yeah. We did a lot. <laughs> and yeah. it also was taking us increasingly longer and longer to film the videos Um to edit them, when I say longer to film them, more a larger percentage of the time that we were filming uh, or that we were visiting a place was filming. Um, and then actually when we moved here to the Netherlands, I spent about nine months, my full-time job was just editing, um, you know, months worth of videos that we had shot that hadn't been edited. And um, it, it was really a lot of work. Yeah, well, you know, Consider outsourcing that, or is that just something you want to keep so on brand with your kind of storytelling? Yeah, you know, it's um, it's a funny thing. Everybody, everybody asked that uh, because, of course, it was not not sustainable and it wasn't scalable. Um, mm. If the two of us were going to be in the videos because we'd put ourselves sort of as the face of the spread, but we had to go and do the traveling, and it it re remained or it, um, retained an uh, element of authenticity when we were filming ourselves. So the idea wow. of filming, of hiring somebody to come and film us was talked about, but ultimately the sort of authentic goofiness and enthusiasm that the two of us have together when we're filming, um, we really didn't want to mess with that. And when we do the filming, we kind of already know in our heads exactly how it should be edited, how these little pieces yeah. are going to all splice together. And the challenge of getting that down onto, like downloading that into somebody else's brain to do, um, yeah. it, it really just felt like it would lose some of that magic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's totally understandable and relatable. Did you ever struggle with, you know, you know, wanting to experience the, the location, the culture of the trip over recording and to create the content? So trying to find that balance of what do you want to show versus what do you want to... Because sometimes keeping the memory is just as important as, you know, capturing the moments as well. How did you get on with that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and there's some some definite definite parallels here with um, having a young child too, wanting to capture every single moment, but also wanting to be in the moment and not wanting to have your phone out. It's it's very difficult to figure out what the balance is. I think Anne and I have a we remember many of the trips because we've seen the videos so many times, mm. and that helps us remember exactly what we were doing, feeling, saying, everything else. There's also numerous trips. Um, probably, uh, for every trip we filmed, there's one that we didn't film. Um, mm. so hiking to Machu Picchu, um, visiting the salt flats in Bolivia. Um, uh, there are a lot of these trips where we just said for this trip, we're just not filming. <laughs> it's not happening. Mm. Uh, so we, we tried to strike that balance. Another thing that we did was we would go somewhere for maybe a week and we'd film for 48 hours and then stop and mm. just spend the rest of the time just you know, um, enjoying, uh, trying to strike that balance because it could be pretty, um, 
yeah, it can have a real impact when you're trying to enjoy a place that you're like, ah, I just need to get this established, establishing shot of the sunset, or it'd be really great if you could just say a couple words at this. And then it's like, come on, man, can we just have a drink and just relax? <laughs> you know, so uh, that, that, that it, it really becomes a balance. Yeah. Well, for anyone that's maybe watching this and, and being inspired by some of your locations and adventures and maybe want to get into content creation themselves, what advice would you give a newbie getting into this this space? Uh, getting into and creating uh, adventure content yeah. or filming or both? Yeah, both. Yeah, so so yeah, because like you say, there's a proliferation of travel content and there is a lot of regurgitated yeah. uh, stuff. And, and with it, uh, you know, the advent of the AI, there's a lot of junk. You know, brutal. There's a lot of stuff that just spamming you know various platforms at the minute and these ai voices and stuff and yeah it's hopefully that settles yeah. down and goes away at some point in time but you know for someone that, that has a bit of you know, creativity and actually wants to get out and tell a story and create their own adventure or just general travel channel what, what would you say to them based on your experiences what advice would you give yeah, i would say that yeah i would say that it's really important to figure out what your voice is um what are you trying to say and who are you trying to say it to? And what is the value that somebody is going to get from, from following mm-hmm. you? And really, really stay away from trace it, chasing trends um, mm-hmm. that you see. Um, make sure that your content is high quality. Make sure that it's unique. And make sure that it, that it serves a purpose. And especially now with so many different platforms, if you are creating content for different platforms, Figure out a way to vary it up and incentivize your audience to follow you on different platforms and see different content. Um, so create threads on on Twitter and leave them there. Um, create other content on on YouTube, longer form stuff, and leave it there. And um, and find another purpose for you know for Facebook or TikTok or whatever you're using. But try to provide value uh, because ultimately. It's a sea of content. And if you're doing the same thing as everybody else on all the same channels, you're really just going to get yeah. lost. Uh, and your voice will just be, be, be nothing. Yeah, I think, I think that's a great piece of advice. I like the idea of like diversifying your content to the, the individual platform as well. Because even with the advent of threads now from like three, or from Meta, you see the same things. If you go to Twitter on X and, and then you see the same content reposted on threads and then it's reposted on Instagram, it's just the same thing on three different platforms from the same creators. A lot of the time, it's, it, it doesn't really add anything yeah. other than, you know, fractured attention. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's also important to learn to really test different platforms and figure out what, what works on different platforms um, yeah. because it's one thing to decide what you're going to do on different platforms. It's another thing to have your audience that follow you there, tell you what they, what they value, right? Because uh, there may be people that follow you on one that don't follow you on the others and they're following you for a specific reason. So yeah. figure that out. I would say, ask questions. Um, we did a lot of polls, right? We did a lot of um, 48 hour trips where we would put a poll on Instagram and we would have, People just vote where they wanted us to go, or we'd show up in a place and we would say, "Do you want us to film here? Yes or no?" Uh, and really, like, if you say no, we're not doing it. If you're sick and tired of seeing our faces, we're done. You know. Um, and so that was that. That's something that I think you really need to respect. Is it's a two way relationship with your audience, uh, and engaging yeah. them is critical. Well, that's that's incredible. Yeah, invite them into that and make them feel part of it. Then then not commodities, and you you really. You, know, you, you will inspire people. That's yeah, that's incredible. So, what's what's the kind of? In fact, before I ask that, so did you do any other sort of collaborations on your travels with any brands or stuff, or or that? Did you do any? This yeah, is sponsored travel. But how did that go? Yep. Yeah, yeah. So something that um, I think many many travelers will figure out when they start growing an audience and they pick up a little bit of steam or excitement there will be brands that reach out to you um you'll start working on creating your media kits and getting your social numbers Mm -hmm. all together and trying to come up with sponsored packages and then you'll start getting pitched ideas for things that seem absolutely insane and have nothing to do with your brand and you'll probably start thinking ah but they're going to give me 300 bucks should i peddle these sunglasses to my audience um, and again, that goes into that building trust with your audience, right? 
Um, yeah. It's a very um, intimate relationship and they trust you. And if you want to build that trust, you need to be very careful on the sponsored content that you create and the brands that you work with. So for us, um, over time, we built some really strong relationships with um, brands along the way. And we made it very clear who we were working with. Um, and it was all brands um, and businesses that we worked really close with and used. So we had a very long standing relationship with Eastpac, uh, the backpack oh. company, um, because we traveled with only backpacks for all of our trips. You know, it was a very natural. It was a natural fit. We had the hashtag team backpack on our content, which is what led them to us. Uh, mm -hmm. And that was a really great um, partnership for us. Uh, we worked closely with uh, Hertz for a long time um, because we did lots of road trip content. Um, and that was also, you know, people watch, were watching our content, wanting to know how to do road trips and um, getting a rental car is a pretty important part of that process. So, so that was a very natural fit for us as well. Uh, and we worked with a number of tourism boards, um, uh, of course, to feature their destinations, right? Um, and that that was also just a, a natural win-win um, situation. Um, so there's there's tons of opportunity and potential, but I would I would caution anybody to really sit back and and decide which brands you want to associate with. Um, that you're going to stand behind, that you use, that you trust, um, that you're going to share with your audience, um, because there is a a wall of sponsorship opportunities that that come, and most of them are pretty weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I mean, you just have to look at Instagram to see some of the the, the, the weird stuff that some of these influencers are pushing, and I think you can quite easily see that they're chasing chasing money as opposed to to build a brand and a, an audience and, and actually doing something for the for the good of themselves or, or other people, you know, chasing the money is, is so obvious. Uh, yeah. And a huge thing is that you will know it's a good brand to work with if they don't tell you how to do anything. If they say, huh. we love your content, if you can figure out a way how to integrate our product or our name into it, go for it. Um, if it's a force, don't. You know, so um, for Eastpac, especially like working with them, we had such a great relationship because they never told us a single, single thing. And they didn't, they didn't see our, no, nobody saw our content before we published it. We never mm -hmm. share, shared it with a, a brand or anybody before. They just said, we love what you're doing. If you can integrate our products into it, we'd really love it. And um, building those relationships allowed us ultimately to offset the cost of our six months uh, of travel after we left Dubai by about 50%, uh, which wow. was huge. That's incredible. You know, lifetime of experiences and, and memories for 50% of the cost. That's incredible. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so what does the future hold for, for you and Anne? Any plans for more material, a book, documentaries? What, what does the future hold for what does it suck? Yeah, so so right now, yeah, right now the big project is a book. Um, it's a book that I've been working on for over four years. Um, it's a massive labor of love, and it's one of the most difficult things I've ever had to do. Um, but, you know, it's sort of all of the behind the scenes um, of my travel journey bef before I met Anne meeting Anne and everything since and all those travels. And there's, um, there's a lot that happens when you travel for 20 years <laughs> and <laughs> when you find yourself, uh, an expat for 10 years unintentionally and you, um, yeah, I never meant to, to leave the U S uh, for this long and, uh, uh, end up, living in one country, married to a woman from another with, you know, like we said, kids <laughs> speaking multiple languages. Um, it's uh, it's an interesting journey. So um, our goal with What Doesn't Suck was really to keep our content light, engaging, funny, and enthusiastic. Uh, there's, of course, a sea of emotions that go into 
uh, two decades of travel and everything that you experienced along the way. So this is um, this book is really a love letter to all to all those travels and um, getting into some of those uh, details, like being held at gunpoint in Malaysia and being detained by the military police in Tajikistan <laughs> uh, and everything in between. Awesome. So, so wait, are you self-publishing or have you got a deal? Or what, what's your plans? Uh, I'm working on I'm working on multiple Can different for different uh, ah, options. Right, okay. uh, mm-hmm. I can't say any. Yes. Yeah, I can't say anything now. But hopefully, um, hopefully next year sometime, uh, this this will be out. We are Excellent. super super excited about it. Excellent. Yeah. Likewise. Okay. So keep me posted on that. Uh, I would like to to get a copy and, uh, and read it. Absolutely. Maybe get you back on to talk about the, the nitty gritty details. Uh, you don't want to give all the, the good. Don't give the juicy bits away just yet. Yeah. Can't give it all away. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. No, that's very exciting. Excellent. Is is that been is that been a bit of a, a, a dream to do that then, or, or is it something that just kind of came to you through COVID or something? Yeah, it's no, it's it's always been something that I've wanted to do and I actually wrote most of it before COVID happened. Oh, um okay. but um again it comes back to how can I can I create something that's of value um in uh-huh. a sea of travel memoirs and sort of life advice from travel and all of this. Uh so it's something that I've sat on for four years working my way through trying to figure out how can I really make this something that is uh, unique and valuable. And uh, we're getting there. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Right. Okay. So, so we are coming up you know, on time, Jeff. And as I said, want to be respectful of your time. Really enjoyed the conversation. Uh, so, so thank you. But as we approach the end, there are two closing traditions we've got on the show. Uh, first one is a call to adventure and the second one is a, a, a paid forward suggestion for a good or charitable cause. But starting with the call of adventure, it could be a place, an activity, an adventure, or you know, you've done plenty of adventure. So give us a suggestion for, for the listeners. The best thing that I can say from everything that Ann and and I have done is to go to somewhere that you know absolutely nothing about and um, take no preconceived notions or stereotypes or objectives into it. Um, You know, one of the last big trips that that Ann and I did before COVID was to Albania and Ann planned this entire trip without me knowing about it. And I managed to actually get all the way to Albania and when the plane landed and, and they announced where we were, I had no idea where we were. Um, and that ability to land somewhere and discover it in real time, uh, bringing absolutely nothing to the table, that to me is the most adventurous um, thing possible in the way that you can just immediately interact with a country and a culture, bringing nothing to the table, which means that you are open to absolutely everything that it gives you. Um, and, and that I think is, is one of the most beautiful things about travel. Um, so going to places that you've seen on Instagram and that you've heard about and seen pictures for your whole life is fantastic. Um, but if you can break away from that, if you have an opportunity, absolutely do it. Excellent. Yeah. Go somewhere unsheltered. Excellent. Thank you. Exactly. And, and for the final segment, so pay it forward, a suggestion or of any good causes, anything that may be uh, important to you uh, that you want to raise up awareness of? Yeah, um, I, I would say that the thing that had the biggest impact on my early traveling was volunteering. Uh, I think I mentioned that I, that I went to Thailand after the tsunami in 2004 um, when I didn't know where Thailand was on the map. I didn't know where I was going when I got on that airplane and I didn't know where in the world I was when I walked off of it. Um, but interacting with a culture through volunteering and through acts of service um, is something that I really became um, drawn to uh, and ended up doing the same in the Philippines and Bangladesh back in the U.S. Um, as well with natural disasters. And so the, the organization that I worked with is called All Hands. Um, they're still active today, you know, 20 years later. Um, I think they're, they're, they're setting up operations right now in in Morocco, uh, for everything that's just happened there this week. So, um, 
I love them. They're a fantastic organization to get involved with, but any opportunity to interact with a local uh, culture through volunteering is a way to just um, have a, a, an experience that's even a level deeper. And I, and I would recommend it to absolutely anybody. Excellent. Thank you very much. We'll check that out and we'll get that listed uh, in the show notes as well in the, the pack when it's published. Thank you, Jeff. So as we finally wrap up, where can people find more about you and all things uh, What Doesn't Suck? Yeah, all things What Doesn't Suck. Uh, find us on, on all the socials under What Doesn't Suck. Um, I would say follow our Facebook, follow our YouTube. Um, that's where most of our content is. Of course, what doesn't suck.com as well. And um, stay tuned for more uh, things coming up. Some exciting things. And the book. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. For the show notes and further information, please visit adventurediaries.com slash podcast. And finally, we hope to have inspired you to take action and plan your next adventure, big or small. Because sometimes... We all need a little adventure to cleanse that bitter taste of life from the soul. Until next time, have fun and keep paying it forward. Are you on Instagram? If so, then please give Adventure Diaries a follow. The page is at Adventure Diaries underscore underscore or simply search Adventure Diaries Chris Watson and you'll find additional podcast content and adventure content too. So go and add me now on Instagram and I'll see you over there. Thank you.